Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Siri Husvet to discuss her new collection of essays, Mothers, Fathers, and Others, published by our friends at Simon & Schuster. Siri Hustved, a novelist and scholar, has a PhD in English literature and is a lecturer in psychiatry at Weill Cornell Medical College. She's the author of a book of poems, seven novels, four collections of essays, and two works of nonfiction. She has published papers in various academic and scientific journals and is the recipient of numerous awards, including the prestigious Princess of Asturias Award for Literature, an American Academy of the Arts and Letters Award in Literature, and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize for Fiction for The Blazing World, which was also longlisted for the Man Booker Prize. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Sarah Rule, a playwright and writer of other things. Her 15 plays include In the Next Room, or Vi the Vibrator play, The Clean House, and Eurydice. She has been a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, a Tony Award nominee, and the recipient of the MacArthur Genius Fellowship. She has received the Steinberg Playwright Award and the Samuel French Award, among many others. She teaches at the Yale School of Drama. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to post your questions by asking by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And please order your copy of Mothers, Fathers, and Others from Books and Books below. Thank you for supporting independent bookstores. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello and welcome. Hello, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's such an honor to be here with this incredibly brilliant writer who who just, you know, has this exquisite book of essays. Um, and I thought we could start out by hearing a little bit from you to read a little excerpt. I, I would love to hear it in your voice. Yeah. So um, before we say that, I have to say that the honor here is mutual. I'm absolutely delighted to be talking to a wonderful playwright and also um, a terrific essayist, just so <laughs> we get that clear <laughs> to begin with. OK, I'm just going to read a little over a page. This is um, from an essay called A Walk With My Mother. My mother died in 2019. And this is a um, meditation on her, but also on uh, motherhood and maternity in general. Every human being is a complex amalgam of features we recognize only because they are repeated in time. I remember the mother of my early childhood, the bedtime rituals, her hugs and kisses, the feel of her skin, the wondrous smell of her in the dim light, the lamp that stood in the hallway so my sister Leave and I would not lie in total darkness. My mother would adjust the crack in the door exactly to our liking, opening and closing it by an inch, two inches, half an inch, until we sang out, just right. I remember Leave and me cozying up with her, one girl under each arm. I remember her kneeling before me to button up my sweater and the feel of her tying a scarf around my neck, the gentle tug at the end of the process as she arranged it. And I remember the feeling of a woolen hat being pulled securely over my ears. I want my darlings to be warm. Hmm. My mother's presence was comfort, safety, happiness. I was in love with my mother and my passionate attachment to her never ended. It remains with me after her death. The physical intimacy between us changed, but that too never ended. My mother and I embraced and caressed each other until the end of her life. When she was really old, I would often lie beside her in her bed and gently rub her arm. As her daughters grew older, my mother was wary of intruding on our privacy. She believed in knocking on doors, not banging through them. 
She never forced conversations. When we talked, she listened to me carefully, her eyes returning to mine throughout our dialogue. When I was a teenager, she was especially careful, aware, no doubt, that I boiled with thoughts and feelings and secrets. Don't do anything you don't really want to do, she told me. The sentence passed through me like a bolt of electricity. I have written about that wise sentence once before. I now know she offered the same advice to at least one other daughter. I have three sisters. <laughs> it can only be given to a person who is not an unbridled hedonist or a psychopath, of course, but I've returned to her words again and again. I knew at the time it was mostly, although not entirely, sexual advice. If you don't really want it, sex will be bad. Don't accommodate pushy men. Her words helped me. Accommodation in many forms was expected of the nice middle-class girl in my Midwestern world. Smiles and nods and gold stars were the rewards for her role as sensitive reader of the desires of others. She resisted stepping forward to speak for the second time because she might be seen as a know-it-all. Rather than correct her teacher's blatant error of fact, she let it pass. She was chronically helpful and pathologically cheerful. And if accommodation meant continually doing things she did not really want to do, the inevitable anger and aggression she felt were suppressed because other people came first. After a while, she couldn't even recognize those emotions for what they were anymore. The nice middle-class girl played a maternal part long before she took on the role of mother, if she took on the role of mother. This social pressure was part of the invisible institution intended to keep women under control. <laughs> a little piece of a much longer essay. Uh, I love it so much. And I, I feel like I know your mother now. And I feel also <laughs> like I learned from her. Um, in that passage about motherhood. I mean, I have three kids and what you say about she never forced conversation and she thought res respecting the child was also important in addition to loving the child. Um, she just seemed remarkably wise. And I also remember reading in your book um, when you talk about missing your mother's empathy yeah. and just to quote you, you say the the only wanting the best is empathy. Empathy is not being the other person. It is feeling into the other person. A foreign experience, empathy recognizes difference. Difference, I feel the loss of my mother's empathy. So beautiful. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about empathy because it, it seems to me that's one of the big themes that that runs through this gorgeous collection, the idea of empathy between mothers, fathers, and others, you know, of, of readers, of writers, of, of societies, you know, empathy or lack thereof. Well, we, uh, we had a couple of emails um, before, and actually, uh, um, reading you, I noted something that came from your mother, and simply by chance, I'm writing a novel now. And I put this before I had before I reached what you you mentioned the Venn diagram, mm -hmm. right? And I had used that before I read your passage about the Venn diagram and your mother. Um, and I had put it in the mouth of a character in a in a novel I'm working on, and it happens to be a mother too. And she's mm -hmm. talking about um, overlap another word that we've actually used both of us as well, which is there is um, a place in empathy where you can think of it as a Venn diagram, where there's a certain kind of overlap, but the circles are nevertheless distinct. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this is an area that I've been exploring for many years, and um, it comes out of a number of thinkers that I'm interested in. Um, and I've stolen the word from Martin Buber, who mm -hmm. talks about the between. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Buber was a person who believed 
um, that the between, the thing that could be created between two people, he's usually talking about an I and a you, mm -hmm. um, that that had an ontological reality. I mean, that that was a, a kind of being in itself. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very interesting idea to explore because we have a tendency to use a word like relationship, which is perfectly mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, but we also, especially in um, Western culture, um, are so focused on the individual and cultivating the self that we have a tendency to forget that that there's a between, you know, mm -hmm. and this between isn't always, um, you know, wondrous. Um, in one, another essay and another book, I say, you know, I understood at one point that two people who seem perfectly nice <laughs> can create a monster between them. <laughs> 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 and and you know so so there are the, this between is a, a very interesting area i mean to to look at i mean the the german philosopher edmund husserl talks about intersubjectivity which is you know the, again this kind of crossing over and so empathy that that empathy is a foreign experience comes from the philosopher edith stein someone who wrote a really beautiful and i have to say pretty hard book <laughs> mm -hmm. on, on, on empathy. She was a student of Husserl's, but she does not adopt him lock, stock and barrel at all. And she really tries to come to terms with that business. You know, mm -hmm. it's not being the other person, right? Uh -huh. It's, it's, it's something else, but those are the, those feelings, those empathetic feelings, I think are, our avenue into the other. Hmm. I love that the between. I'm I'm a Martin Buber fan as well, and I had written a collection of poetry um, a year ago that I titled "Forty Four Poems for You" because I like utilitarian titles, but I also wanted to acknowledge the reader and to acknowledge that space between that the book was creating. And um, I love when you talk about language, the idea that even uttering a word, you're already in relation, you know, you That's didn't right. language yourself, you're part of culture. And um, you say it is a cultural habit in the West to think of the mind as a locked room, fundamentally isolated from the minds of others. Did it, did it strike you at all when you were working on this collection? It was maybe during the pandemic, you were putting it together. And we were sort of in these locked rooms. Did you feel this call? to sort of connect with other minds beyond? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is, you know, an, an idea that I've been thinking about, you know, for many, many years. Um, but at the same time, an experience um, like the pandemic certain, certainly focuses <laughs> your mind. I mean, I work alone every day anyway. Mm -hmm. At the same time, my husband and I realized that we were, shorn of all social existence yeah. and um you know we're not exactly party people but we did you know we did go out to dinner with friends mm -hmm. and suddenly those friends were were not accessible not available to us and um and i did uh yes i have i have lots of essays floating around some of them you know will probably be part of a much more scholarly book, you know, mm -hmm. lectures I've given. But I really wanted this book to move from uh, stories and meditations about intimate people, especially mm -hmm. the mother part, mm -hmm. my grandmother, my mother, um, and then to move into somewhat more abstract territory, mm -hmm. but also literary mothers and artistic mm -hmm. mothers that have been really important to me. Like Louise Bourgeois with the cover. Yes. I feel so happy about this cover. I, oh, I feel like I, this book. <laughs> I love Louise Bourgeois and I've this is actually my third essay, the longest I've ever written about her work. But um she's you know one of those uh artists and I mean that in the big way you know people making all different kinds of art who's stuck with me mm -hmm. 
And, and it is also because she is an artist of the between actually. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, she's continually blurring borders, um, which is something that, that, that interests me a lot. You know, we rely so heavily on the given concepts of the culture mm -hmm. that we often fail to question them. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I mean, you talk about magic and how it directs our attention so that, you know, if a gorilla is walking by, we, we might fail to notice it, you know, in the same way that we don't notice, a fish doesn't notice that it's swimming in water, you know, what are these things culturally we don't notice? And I love the order that you chose for the collection in terms of I love it, having a child possibly flush the toilet and come in, we'll see what happens. That's, appropriate. that's good. It's all appropriate. Absolutely. Well, yeah. <laughs> so speaking of the order you chose about the mother, the grandmother, the particularity, the warmth of those connections, um, the way they're embedded in story and touch, and then moving through more sort of complex theories of mind or, you know, philosophical subjects. And I think that for me, that's a deeply feminist enterprise. I mean, you had talked about being in a, a philosophy class or trying to go to philosophy class with these Kant um, men who were smoking pipes and all had beards or seemed to, and you were like, oh my God, I'm, and, and you just, you fled. I mean, can you speak to... This is, it's good. It's, it's really funny now. Of course, it was not funny at the time. I got special... Yeah permission, right, to go up one floor in Philosophy Hall at Columbia to, you know, to kind of audit this Kant seminar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had, of course, I was not expect. I walked through the door and in my memory, and of course, my memory must be wrong. And I say that in the essay, were, you know, nine young men and a professor and they all had beards and they were all smoking pipes. <laughs> <laughs> and they completely ignored me. It was as if I didn't exist. In fact, they they cringed when I walked through the door. Mm -hmm. And I realized that this was, you know, um, sacred male space mm -hmm. and a female intruder was not welcome. I did make a comment. No one, they, they actually pretended as if I mm -hmm. were not in existence. Um, it was a shocking experience. I left, I ran. And as I point out, my running um, is, you know, makes it clear that in some way I participated in, mm -hmm. I use the word symbolic violence, mm -hmm. in the symbolic violence of these guys. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's both sad and funny. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's over, man. I don't. I don't run from anything now. Uh, but I. Sh I sure did. I was uh, probably twenty four, you know, possibly twenty five. Well, I can remember. I mean, I went to school later, but still, I remember taking a philosophy class um, as an undergrad, and I was the only woman in this like Plato seminar. It was all men, and I. I for it, for me it was like a point of pride just to try to speak in every class just mm -hmm. so a woman spoke um and it's interesting that philosophy is one of those kind of final terrains where um it's so male dominated I mean do you it think is. it's, it's, it's this so, mind body problem this kind of yeah I think so I mean it's the mind body problem and you know this idea that you know I point out again a couple of times in the essays that we we still live inside um, the Greek separation of the mind from the body. And when you said, you know, that there was touch in my book and, you know, that, that this re recognition of, of feeling, for me, you know, part of my job as a feminist is to, um, first of all, I do not think the mind and body are two different things. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, in the embodied camp in you know the cognitive science uh, world, mm -hmm. but also that by lifting up the body, you are essentially defending um, uh, what has been denigrated in Western culture and associated with with women. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 
you know, the intellect is masculine, the body is feminine, uh, uh, culture is masculine, nature is feminine, mm -hmm. and these distinctions go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And it's time, you know, to <laughs> to end it. <laughs> Together, dismantle. You were talking at one point about how birth is so rarely represented in Western art that you were looking and looking and you couldn't find birth anywhere and how taboo it was. It's, it's, it's actually, it's not there in what we think of as the standard tradition of visual art. Yeah. Um, it is, you know, Frida Kahlo gives birth to herself in the thirties at some point. Right. And, um, and there are a couple of other, I think there's, who is it? There's one other image that, that, that I mentioned in the essay, um, but it's a really dead image. Hmm. Uh, the Greeks, no images of natural birth, only supernatural birth. Hmm. Um, in 2011, they found an Etruscan vase that had an image of a woman uh, squatting and the head of the infant is coming out of her. But the suppression of gestation and birth um, in the Western tradition is stupefying mm -hmm. <laughs> it is yeah. stupefying yeah. and you know i've been fascinated in fact it was funny there was some some reviewer of this book that said well, i really didn't need to hear so much about the placenta wow i am pl i'm planning an entire book <laughs> on the placenta i've been researching it for years <laughs> and i just burst out laughing when i hit the end because i thought i'm sorry honey but that placenta book, if I live, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. I buy that book. And also, like, there's not that much about the placenta in your book. Like, I've got to say. No, it's just a little, it's Ooh. just a little preview. But, you know, the again, to, to uh, push a theme. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the placenta because it's um, a biological between organ. Right. Right. So, um, you know, it, it's remarkable. Much about it is remains unknown, even right. though there's now in 2014, they started um, the Placenta Project, which is huh. um, well-funded uh, research on this remarkable transient organ. Huh. You know, we all have one. And in other cultures, um, as many people know, it's uh, treated with reverence as right double or twin of the of the fetus um and also in the in in the west in folk traditions and it's certainly true. midwives wrote a lot about this so so it's not as if it was just dumped but with the medicalization of birth um the placenta was simply pushed out of the story and so much so, <laughs> you got me going. In 1978, there was a conference in the UK of obstetricians, right? Mm -hmm. This is, it wasn't a big one. I think there were 45, 50 people, something like that. And then the name of the conference was Placenta, the Neglected Experimental Animal. <laughs> now, I read that entire fairly, you know, dull thing. I mean, yeah. you know, I learned uh, some stuff in it, but but what you find out that after that, um, the placenta, all the papers in, it, we're still talking about the 90s and the 2000s, referred to it as forgotten, neglected, um, you know, <laughs> the, the Rodney Dangerfield, this is maybe only for older people, but <laughs> Rodney Dangerfield was a comic who Thank used you. to come come on stage and say his his mantra was, I get no respect. Right, so, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so anyway, it. that's so I'm very interested in thinking about our origins and the um, almost hysterical need in Western culture to make sharp borders between um, the the maternal and the um, embryo fetus mm -hmm. and very, very dependent animal that we give birth to when we do. Yeah. <laughs> As you know. 
Well, it's funny about the placenta because for me, the, I remember the placenta really was an afterthought. I, I talk about um, in this latest book, giving birth to twins and the, the birth was so um, dramatic because it was really yeah. high risk and it was walking this razor's edge. So after I gave birth and it was a vaginal birth, then it was like, they're like, it's time for the placenta after, you know, two babies. I was like, oh my God, I utterly forgot. Not the placenta. <laughs> thing. It's really another thing. Um, and I remember I shook violently after the placenta was delivered and no one told me that it was normal to shake or you could have shaking. Yes, yes, yes. And I thought, why didn't nobody tell me, you know, why didn't no one pass? I, I was there shaking. The twins were holding hands. I was relieved. Everything was normal, but I thought something was really wrong with me. Um, and there was well, there are lots of things they don't tell you. This is what I, I realized. And there, and there are actually many things that are um, not even available to be read, mm -hmm. you know, for non-specialists, you know, like, yeah. but, um, but yeah. One should be told. One should be told. And I want to read your book, The The Shaking. Yes. The shaking, I mean, yes. Right? yes. I, that was, um, yeah, that was my shaking uh, symptom that, yeah. um, that I had not many times, but, um, but it was quite dramatic every time I had it. And what interested me about it most was that, um, you know, I'm deeply connected to psychiatrists, neuroscientists, yeah. neurologists, and nobody, nobody had an answer. Hmm. And including my absolutely wonderful neuro neurologist, Dr. Linda Lewis, hmm. um, who I sent the book to. And she said, I we, we're, we just agree that we, we don't actually know mm -hmm. what this is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's wonderful to explore um, a, a nameless symptom. <laughs> well, and yeah, and I, I, I guess, I, what did I get diagnosed with once? A benign tremor. I had a benign tremor for a while, it's, and that seemed uh, nice. Uh, it, it's I, I have that too. It's um, mm -hmm. it's um, what is it called? Um, a standing tremor or something? Is that mm -hmm. you? You just you have a little shake in you. Mm -hmm. a little um, shake in you. Always, <laughs> <laughs> which is um, quite. It's it's not it's not um, a deeply abnormal thing, but my shakes were 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 big. Yeah, well, I love that you insist on the body. You know, you insist on placentas or shaking, or you know that that you have one. Even I mean, I think because your mind is so incandescent, and I and I think some people might be intimidated by your mind on the page or go, "This is really heady stuff," and you say yes and. <laughs> and there's a body, you know, and there's yeah. a life. And I, I feel like this collection of essays is really a, a testament to that, to kind of um, insisting on, on, on the eye and, and, and defies our expectation of, of genre. Um, yeah. You know, even my scholarly papers, I, I write in the first person and, and I do it for, a philosophical reason. In other words, the the third person voice of much scholarship, I mean, not all, but much of it, um, to me is an unsituated voice um, of authority. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, the God's eye view. Well, we really don't have that, right? Mm -hmm. We're all situated beings. And um, I have no intention of you know making uh authoritative declarations from on high so mm -hmm. even when i'm writing like a you know a peer commentary i i write in the first person mm -hmm. um <laughs> my dog's trying to get in <laughs> um i wonder if we can talk about the last chapter of your book a little bit which is you know, an incredible and upsetting chapter about um, a murder and torture in Indiana that happened. And I can't remember if it was in that chapter that you said something about the smugness of the third person and how inadequate it was. Um, yeah, to... I think it is early on. Yeah. I'm um, going to let my dog in. Hold, and I'm, but I'm please listening. Please let him in or her. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, 
Yes, this it, it's fun. I mean, it was actually um, the the entire essay was published in in Lit Hub on online recently, and I looked and it, there were there were no comments. You know, you check just to see. I think this, um, you know, this particular uh, torture murder is what it what it is, is something that's so horrifying that either people um, have an almost perverse fascination with it, or they avoid it altogether. Well, yeah. I, I understand that because I had very um, uh, complex feelings about entering into this territory. The reason I did it is that I think we need to ask ourselves questions about the kind of violence that happens. Now, this was a white girl living in a poor white neighborhood in Indianapolis. You know, people, what what would now be called the precariat, right? Mm -hmm. People who are living from basically hand to mouth. Uh, but they're all white people. Uh, the parents of this of the victim uh, leave town and they leave her with, with a woman who has lots of children. Mm -hmm. And that woman uh, becomes the ringleader of the torture and finally the murder of this 15-year-old uh, uh, child. And the question is, how does this happen? And what is this kind of violence? Well, the essay is called Scapegoat, and I'm very interested in scapegoating. To pick apart this little, well, it's, you know, it's horrible, but it's nevertheless small. It's a small mob. Mm -hmm. But we see a lot of mob violence, and it is coded politically, mm -hmm. which makes it easier to talk about. As I said, this Sylvia Lykins, she's not Anne Frank, you know, she's not the uh, victim of a lynching it's not political in obvious ways which makes it a forum or a place to dig into this kind of group violence mm -hmm. where a group gangs up on one mm -hmm. now this girl didn't do anything right she really became the scapegoat for the malaise of the community and of the people who tortured her. Mm -hmm. uh, I think to understand that better is something we should do. And I do make political comparisons to mm -hmm. Charlottesville and um, to some of the rallies that we saw yeah. uh, during the last administration. I think it's really timely to look at how a group can turn like that. And you talk about um, one theorist, is it Gerard, who talks yeah. about the idea yeah. of yeah. violence being contagious? Mm -hmm. And um, and that, I mean, he really has a scapegoat theory. I mean, mm -hmm. as I point out, I think it's, I mean, he's explaining human violence through the scapegoat theory. I think that's a little broad. Mm -hmm. That's a little big in a way. But, but there have been many... Um, and I mentioned some of them. There are many theories I'm starting, especially in the 19th century, about what is a mob. Yeah. And again, it enters into what we've been talking about from the beginning, which is, of course, the opposite of empathy, in a way, right? But it's nevertheless contagious feelings mm -hmm. that will run through a crowd. Right. Um, you know, Kierkegaard talks about this too, you know, that that things can happen in crowds that individuals in that crowd would never do. Mm -hmm. So then we have to ask ourselves, so what is that contagious feeling that moves through crowds or even a little mob of children and a sadistic woman, right? Who's punishing uh, this girl for unknown crimes, probably things that are inside herself that she wants to expel onto. Mm -hmm this other body. And we see that with, um, you know, racism, mm -hmm. uh, misogyny. It's often these internal conflicts that then get focused on the other. Yeah. I mean, January 6th, I just remember watching just 
paralyzed with terror and disgust. And then the details that came out afterwards about um, what, what was said about Nancy Pelosi, what was said about um, black um, yeah. uniform guards, what was said about Jews at the Capitol. Yeah. I mean, it was all of that. And um, Confederate flags. I mean, I, I wrote a piece for, um, Oh yeah, Der Spiegel in Germany, in which I said, I mean, this looked like nothing so much as the lynchings, um, you know, it, it, in the South where they were completely open, where people posed smiling in front right. of the of the, you know, horrifying desecrated bodies mm -hmm. um, of black people as you know it, as if it were and took picnic food mm -hmm. and uh you know uh took parts of the body home as souvenirs yeah. Yeah. uh i mean those smiling white faces mm -hmm. not hidden no this proudly this was, not, this was not the few feeble antifa people that have the masks on yeah. these people felt that they were doing this with impunity so there we you know this is something that has to be discussed and i think it can't be um it has to be seen as what can happen in human beings mm. mm -hmm. right it's not um you know or you look at you know the stories of the holocaust you know how could this happen how could people do this well I think we have to look at what is human about this. Well, and especially when a figurehead gives permission so that the, yeah. the whole culture thinks it's permissible. And now that we learn that, you know, the orders were given for the National Guard to protect those folks at all costs only yeah. the day before. So it's it's really terrifying. And so I I was really interested in the parts of your book where you were looking at the present moment politically we found ourselves we find ourselves in yes. um, and then looking at some really dark moments in history to kind of refract and reflect yeah well look at i mentioned the cultural revolution right oh those students who were torturing their teachers i just i mean it is yeah. extraordinary i mean you know there are many many stories to be told from the cultural revolution but we know that these um teenagers who had been given permission right? right this is the this is an important element somehow permission is given the same with those children in that house mm -hmm. who tortured this fellow child right because they had permission from the woman the mom mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i mean talk about the dark side of, yeah. of the maternal you yeah. know I, my position is that we have to look at all of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why Louise Bourgeois's work is also so always interesting because it's not a kind of sweet <laughs> image of the no. material. You know, it's no. very complicated no. and dark. Yeah, and, and, and I also think that what, you know, Bourgeois is great at this is, you know, understanding where the fear, the fear of women, the fear, especially of the maternal comes from, right? It comes from the profound dependence that every infant has um, on someone else, right? If not the mother. I mean, little horses stand up and can walk. After yeah. a few yeah. I mean, I, I saw I saw um, a, a, a foal being born once. It mm -hmm. was just amazing. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, human beings need to be carried around for about a year. Mm -hmm. And even then, as you know, one-year-old, two-year-olds, <laughs> these, these, you cannot let them out of your sight. So we're dependent animals for a very, very long time. And that's probably why we're so highly socialized. It's one theory, right? That mm -hmm. we, we become ourselves through others. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, I have so many questions, but I also want to be mindful that yes. maybe people in the audience do. Oh, yes. And I, yes. Um, the chat. I I I was going to ask for some help reading what the chat says because I don't totally understand this technology. Um, ask a question. Maybe Chris. Oh, yeah, here's one. I see one. <laughs> you see? I want, Perfect. I wanted, I wanted to ask a question about 
what about a one in her book reading symbolic violence i was struck by the proponent of symbolic violence saying that victims most must be complicit that the punishment is somehow right and natural. Yeah. I'm sort of not seeing the question, but maybe you could kind of speak to that topic. I think this isn't, this is a very, um, this is uh, uh, Pierre Bourdieu. He has this idea of symbolic violence and um, how it functions really to keep things as they are, right? Mm to not challenge the hierarchies that exist. And what's interesting is that he makes the argument that in order for this to work, um, the, the victim of the symbolic violence is implicitly participating in it, right? Is not aware that, um, that this is wrong. So for example, when I went into the philosophy room, I kept thinking, what did I do? Mm. You know, like, geez, you know, I must have offended them. You know, I, I mean, I know I didn't. It was really as if I had let out the biggest, stinkiest fart when I went <laughs> into the room. And I knew I hadn't done that, right? We know when we're polluting the atmosphere. <laughs> but that was how it felt. And then rather than say, you know, these guys are just jerks, right? This is pathetic. Mm -hmm. I turned it in against myself yeah. in some way and, and, and fled and never went back. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a form of participation in the symbolic violence that's been mm -hmm. done to you. And I think when, um, you know, that's why it's so important for people, you know, to understand or in a situation like that where it's clearly um, sexism, even stronger, you know, misogyny, uh, that you say something, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. that you don't just let this stuff go right? Uh, because then you are in some way participating and perpetuating the drama because in misogyny, when a person is hurt, when you can visually see that the woman in this case, right, has been hurt, then actually everything is, is fine. The person doesn't have to go any further. It's just, it's over. Mm. Punishment has been meted out. The person is not objecting to the punishment. The world can go on as it always does. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, t to turn to a, like a more cheerful topic. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> one thing you say that I love that I just think should be um, plastered on some, you know, like a, like uh, it's that artist who puts text on things, Jenny. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, art is like sex. If you don't relax, you won't enjoy it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so I, I have said that I finally wrote it. <laughs> really? <laughs> but I do say that, and and it is, of course, kind of funny. But I really believe it. So how do we relax? How can we relax when we're readers and writers and and ma art makers in this? kind of anxiety, age of anxiety? Well, I'm sure you know, as a fellow artist, right, that the state of writing well is a state of relaxed openness mm -hmm. coupled with concentration, mm -hmm. right? But that concentration, again, we're talking about the body, mm -hmm. you know, really being open to what comes. As we know, writing is half an unconscious act <laughs> and if you're defended against you know what i think of as the real material nothing is going to happen to you it's you're not going to write well but the opposite works too right that if you're really nervous about reading or watching a play or or listening to music because it's you know avant-garde or whatever you have some perceptual category that you've placed it in and you think i don't like this i don't want it well you're not gonna want it mm -hmm. right and i mean you you can't want it because you're not open to it mm. but if you relax and you say Oh, I have a good, when I was quite young, a teenager, I really wanted to read James Joyce's Ulysses, mm. as all pretentious teenagers do. <laughs> and <laughs> I started it 
about three times. And I remember, you know, there was this concordance and it was, you know, all the Homer and everything. And oh my goodness, I was so nervous. I couldn't get anywhere with it. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, I think, no, I, I was probably still 19 or, or 20, but I thought to hell with it and to hell with the, you know, the Homer stuff, but just sit down and relax. <laughs> Don't look anything up. Just, mm. you know, read it. I ended up just loving that book, mm. but I wasn't anxious about say, I didn't, you know, know some reference. It didn't, right. it didn't matter. It was, and actually what is the best about Joyce has nothing to do with the Homeric crap. Mm -hmm. What's beautiful about Joyce is actually his embodied <laughs> yeah. evocations. You know, it's like Bloom in the bathtub looking at his penis and saying, Father of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. what's great. You know, it's, it's you know, that kind of, um, yeah, I mean, Joyce is a very earthy mm -hmm. Writer and that earthiness, I think, is what I loved about the book then. And when I've returned to parts of it, is what I like now. Well, and Shakespeare, for example, can be oh. so um, intimidating to to people if they don't know the language. And I do think it it, it creates a feeling of tightness and um, yes, anxiety. Anxiety. I also think for a lot of writers, I know the Trump administration was a time when no one felt they could relax enough to read or write properly because there was this hypervigilance. I think you called it just, you know, being in the Trump show every night. You know, I had this hypervigilance about checking the news every, yeah. you know, 45 yeah. seconds. It was a hard time to write. Did you find that or did you, did you? Yeah. I mean, this is actually one of the reasons that I, I, I wrote a number of these essays or I took, you know, tiny little, bleeps of work that had hadn't been expanded and and turned them into this book some of the essays were written earlier and you know i think the years are all on there but yeah. um but i found that i was able to write with some urgency about the material in this book but i couldn't write fiction uh-huh and I had been thinking about I, I this is the book, book I'm <laughs> trying to write now. I had I've been thinking about it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, my last novel was published in 2019, and I've been you know kind of dreaming this this book, but it was as if what you're talking about that tension, that urgency, and also the strange sense that there's no way to predict the future. Mm -hmm. In other words, the way we live, right, is that we have a past and then we throw it ahead of us mm -hmm. <laughs> through our expectations and that's the fictional land of the future. Mm -hmm. But what happens when that future suddenly is completely occluded mm -hmm. and you look ahead and you have no idea whether, you know, yesterday and today have repetitive power tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so I yeah. needed to, you know, maybe I've gotten used to destability now. So I can, I'm trying to write this book, but, um, but fiction was out of the question. I think it might have to do with exactly what you were saying. I felt that that I was living in an emergency of both pandemic mm -hmm. and politics. Yeah. Or pandemic politics. Yeah. 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 I did too. And I, you know, it's funny. I remember I couldn't write a play all through the pandemic. I did write one haiku a day to kind of stay sane. And I wrote prose, but couldn't write fiction, you know, fictional yeah. play world, imaginary yeah. worlds. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in an emergency, it seems weird to do that. But I remember the moment that the news felt relaxing again. It was after it was after the election and Alex Trebek died, <laughs> the Jeopardy host. Oh, right. It was yes. a lot of airtime. And I remember he was thinking, in the paper a lot. I was like, hi, yeah. oh, everyone's relaxing. We're giving a lot of airtime to the death of the Jeopardy host. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's the level and his kindness. People talk. Just kindness and I thought okay like a deep breath maybe I could maybe I can write again um yeah. there's a question in the chat about math and physics um as yeah. someone who really likes your in interdisciplinary 
concepts in your work, and you mentioned something about math and physics. And uh, maybe we'll okay. Try. So, so I, I just want to like straight out. I, I do, I can, you know, and have been interested in, you know, especially physics um, for lay people. Um, mm -hmm. I really do know a lot about, you know, biology, neurobiology. Uh, the philosophy of biology. So that stuff I really know. Embryology, I've now been studying for a while. So, and physics interests me, but I cannot do the math. In other words, the conversations I've had with physicists, some of them really interesting to me. I do not know how they mathematically arrive at the places that they do. So time, I've read a lot about you know, the ideas of time and physics, which are from a kind of human phenomenological point of view, really difficult to understand, right? The space-time block and the future and, and, the, and the past are just the same and it doesn't make any difference. And, you know, Min Minkowski <laughs> and, and all of that is fascinating. Uh, because it's one way of looking at time. Now, there are physicists who think that this may be wrong. And Charles Sanders Peirce, you know, a wonderful pragmatist uh, American philosopher, um, asked a question which bears thinking about. He said, what if the laws of physics change? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> and Lee Smolin, a very... Um, a very fancy physicist, I think he's now in Canada, um, read Peirce, and he has an idea that actually time in physics um, may exist and also change. And hmm. interestingly, he uses a kind of biological or evolutionary model hmm. rather than the, the static um, space time black model. Well, we don't know, right? <laughs> That's <an amazing laughs> it's, it's fun to read about. And Lee Smolin, if you're interested, I, I recommend, um, reading him. He has a number of books that are abs absolutely possible for people who are not, uh, you know, inside physics to read. That's great. Um, there's another question about the blazing world and Louise Bourgeois and it says loved your essay on Louise Bourgeois and did she inspire the blazing world? You know, this is a really interesting question because I knew she was there in the character, the big character at the center of that book, Harriet Burden. But it wasn't until I was asked to give a talk in uh, Munich where there was a, a Louise Bourgeois show and I um, sat down to write my uh, little lecture and, uh, <laughs> and, and I, you know, I was kind of looking, thinking about it and I, and I thought, no, Louise Bourgeois is all over the place. I mean, in the blazing world that she was a tremendous influence. Now she wasn't alone. You know, there were other artists too. I mean, Alice Neal, um, you know, is, is mentioned, um, I don't think I mentioned Lee Krasner, but there, there are a number of women who sort of got mushed into the hairy ball, <laughs> if you will, but, um, but Bourgeois is really important. And even the work that Harry does, um, I realized had been influenced, um, uh, by Bourgeois. Mm -hmm. And of course she, the, we know from the beginning of the novel that she, uh, the character Harry, has kept um, a notebook devoted to Louise Bourgeois. So, mm -hmm. so, how because you work in multiple genres, and I enjoy working in multiple genres too, um, and maybe it's a restlessness or a desire in me for beginner's mind. You know, I can start over again when I start in a new genre or just the appropriateness of the genre to the idea. How do you, do you find yourself choosing a genre or being in a mood for a particular genre? Yeah, in my case, you know, the, 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 the border crossing is often disciplinary, mm -hmm. right? So 
for example, I, I really got interested in embryology and I, and I had been so immersed in, in neurobiology and I felt pretty smart about it, you know, so I started reading, you know, embryology 101 and, you know, I felt the tears coming into the corners of my eyes because it's like a whole new ballgame. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, I knew about cells, right? I mean, you could there there are certain biological basic basics that you can, but it's really a whole new. And I just what you know, I just teach myself. You know, I just and repetition is the best thing. Hmm. You just like keep reading papers on the same thing, and eventually it starts to sink in. And I think relaxation is part of that. But I all here's the reason that I think it's important to move from one genre to another or to explore different fields, I think it gives you a flexibility of mind that you cannot have otherwise. And I also think it helps to solve problems that couldn't otherwise be solved. Hmm. So that the, the specialization that the culture has come to expect mm -hmm. actually harms us. Mm -hmm. Now, no one wants you know a surgeon you know, who's operated on one person. I mean, it was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> there are reasons for expertise and, you know, there are reasons to praise expertise, mm -hmm. but especially in the sciences, but also in the humanities, I find um, that people run into dead ends and because they have few other avenues for thinking through a problem, they just get stuck there. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting. I also think the specialization in our culture, in the arts anyway, leads to commodification. Yes. You know, you can be more easily commodified if you kind of churn out, you know, a play every year, um, as That's opposed right. to like tacking around. And That's right. And, and I think you, you can notice, you know, that um, people who do other things, like say a playwright who then writes... I can think of several examples, writes a, a book of stories or or something else. The culture doesn't like it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or some, you know, I think, I mean, my own husband has made some films. Mm -hmm. uh, no, <laughs> right. You know, it's like people just don't like it. And mm -hmm. I think we should be wary of that. Mm -hmm. um, even in the theater world, specialization is so important in terms of like the Ford model of making a car. So like if you yeah. go to Europe and you're in a circle and you, you with theater makers, you go around and say, oh, what do you do? And they're like, oh, I'm a designer and a playwright, dabble in acting. And that's normal for a theater person yes. in another country. In America, it's like, I'm a playwright. I'm a director. You kind of stay in your lane. And yeah. it's, I think a way of not being a fuller person person, you know, or just to be a writer, um, full stop, as opposed to I'm a novelist, I'm a scholar. I mean, you've been right. allowed to wear many hats, but I, I, I imagine there was a fight in it at some point, too, to be able to do all the things that you do. Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a perpetual outsider, right? And, and, and this has its advantages. Um, it also has its, you know, uh, disadvantages. Uh, but I think, you know, the fact that I am not, especially when I, if I'm doing like a science lecture, I'm invited because people are interested in what I have to say. Um, but, you know, I'm not competing for funding. <laughs> right? Right. So, so in, in that way, it's an advantage to me. And it's also an advantage that I can say what I want without mm -hmm. worrying about losing my job. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my job goes on, you know, uh, I, I sort of fend for myself here and there. Um, but so that's an advantage of being an, an outsider. Mm -hmm. um, the disadvantages are, are fairly obvious that um, you're not always taken as seriously. Um, you, you have to prove yourself over and over <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, but uh um, we just have a little time left. If anyone has a burning question or if you have something that you wanted to share with um, readers or potential readers about the book that we haven't kind of covered. 
Well, the title is kind of inclusive. <laughs> Mothers, <laughs> fathers, and others. So, you know, there's that covers a lot of ground. And uh, um, yeah, I think it's fair to say that that the the, the book as a whole uh, is about yeah multiple perspectives and um, our relations with others, mm. intimate and less so. I'm gonna hold it up again with the beautiful cover. Yeah. Um, Louise Bosman with yeah the baby amazing. in the middle. She was always the baby. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna thank you both for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank a beautiful you so evening. And just remind everyone, Mothers, Fathers, and Others is available at Books and Books. You can order it right down here by just pressing the green button, or you can come to one of our stores if you're in Miami, and we have it there too. And thank you for supporting indie bookstores like Books and Books. And thank you for sharing your time with us. And congratulations on an amazing book. And I hope we're going to see you in person soon at some point. Yes, we're, we're, we're going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're both in Brooklyn. So, you know, someday I'll have you over for dinner. Exactly. That's what I was just going to say. I will send you an email. We'll, we'll figure this out. I'd love it. Well. And thanks to our viewers for watching. Um, happy holidays yeah. to everyone. Holidays. Thanks, everyone. Good night, thanks everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you.